I also believe the administration was wrong to stand by a statement sympathizing with those who had breached our embassy in Egypt instead of condemning their actions. Romney's response to the Libya crisis comes under fire. Governor Romney seems to have a tendency to uh, shoot first and name later. Also today, U.S.-Israel tensions enter the campaign. It's primary day in New York, and a closer look at the bundlers who bolster Team Obama. I'm Megan Lieberman, live in the New York Times newsroom. The last two days have offered an opportunity to see Mitt Romney respond to an international incident. We'll be talking more about that in a minute, but first, Romney reporter Ashley Parker takes us through the timeline. The attack in Libya was the most vivid example yet of a real-time foreign policy crisis unfolding amid the general election atmosphere here in the U.S. At about 6 a.m. on Tuesday, before the protest began, but after a controversial web video had gained attention, the U.S. Embassy in Cairo released an appeal for religious tolerance in an attempt to cool the tensions. Hours later, mid-afternoon on the East Coast, an attack began on the United States consulate in Benghazi, and one death was initially reported. At 10.24 p.m., apparently in response to the earlier Cairo embassy statement, the Romney campaign released a statement of its own saying that, quote, the Obama administration's first response was not to condemn attacks on our diplomatic missions, but to sympathize with those who wage the attacks. There's a broader lesson to be learned here. And I... It was immediately criticized for distorting the chain of events, with President Obama himself on Tuesday saying that Mr. Romney, quote, seems to have a tendency to shoot first and aim later. Uh, and... As president, one of the things I've learned is you can't do that. Good morning. For his part, Mr. Romney has kept with his line of attack, repeating the charges before reporters on Wednesday, even amid criticism from both sides of the aisle. We express immediately uh, when we feel that the president and his administration have done something which is inconsistent with the principles of America. A quick update on this story. Mitt Romney spoke in the last hour in Virginia and mentioned Libya at the beginning, but declined to repeat his criticism of the president for the third day in a row. National political correspondent Jeff Zeleny joins me now to talk all of this over. So Jeff, uh, the last 48 hours have really been an illustration of how external events can intrude on a very well-planned campaign. No question. I mean, this campaign we've said from the beginning is about the economy until it's not. And this is uh, an example of, I mean, the office of the running for is for president of the United States. And you have to do multiple things at once. And this um, is not just a one-day intrusion. I mean, what happens uh, over the next uh, 54 days in the uh, Middle East, you know, throughout the Arab fall, if we're calling it that, um, whatever happens with that, it will affect this presidential campaign. And w what we're learning in real time is how the Romney campaign, how Governor Romney is responding to this. We saw him, um, a, a slight change of tone at his rally in Virginia today. Um, his advisors say that he's not, he's not backing off, but he is trying to take a more measured approach to this. And some of the second thinking is, or second guessing is that if he would have uh, held off a little bit more, he could have made more of a substantive critique of the Obama administration's policy. He kind of got in the way of that. So in the coming days, I look for him to sort of elevate his rhetoric a little bit more and make more of a, of a, a critique about you know, just the whole handling of this. Like was Libya, for example, should they have been paying more attention to what was going on there uh, right. throughout the The president the has some vulnerability here too, right? Because no the question. president actually is only to the criticism that they were not prepared, that they haven't had a good enough plan going forward right. about how to deal with the Arab Spring or post-Arab Spring right. world. The, the politics aside of this, a United States ambassador was killed the first time in more than 30 years. That is a very serious matter. What's next? What's behind you know, the next uh, turn of the screw on this? I mean, uh, if the Obama administration would have a foreign policy crisis on its hands here, that could also change the election. So this is very serious business. Now, it is still unclear, though, how much this is registering with regular voters, right? I heard a lot of people yesterday talking about this as for the Romney campaign in the criticism, of talking about this as being sort of a Lehman moment for him, referring to uh, Senator McCain's incident in, in 2008 when he sort of pulled back from his campaign and that sort of spelled kind of the end of his campaign. Is that a little hyperbolic? Are we sort of jumping the gun on that a little bit? I'm not sure that it is a leaving moment, just because it's so different. I mean, that was uh, that was about the economy. The the uh, uh, 2008 campaign began as a campaign about the Iraq war, and it ended as a campaign about the economy. But by this point, four years ago, things were already in crisis in terms of the uh, banks and the auto industry, and people et cetera. people were really so, afraid we were going into a, a worldwide depression, No question. And this is not yet 
uh, completely on people's radar screens, but boy, it sure will be. I mean, it's leading the evening news, it's leading the morning news, the newspapers. So this is something that will sort of seep into the uh, psyche of how people evaluate these two candidates. And the debates in October, I mean, this is now a new issue that will be debated. The first debate on October 3rd is uh, supposed to be about the domestic economy, uh, but uh, foreign questions can also be answered. And this is part of the judgment that voters will use to uh, make up their minds. Um. So it, the president was also trying to use this incident of, as a way of saying, in, as he did in his 60 Minutes interview, that, that this is, shows that Mitt Romney isn't ready, that he's not prepared, as he tried to do at the convention in sort of saying that, you know, they were new to foreign policy, this right. team. To me, that was a reflection of this, uh, uh, this president and his campaign team believes that they have the upper hand on this issue. And the polls show that issue. they do have the upper hand on this issue. Exactly. And he was uh, uh, flinging his eye or flinging his uh, finger in the eye of his uh, opponent a little bit there by you know, saying he was uh, moving too quickly on this. I'm not sure that we'll hear that much uh, more from the president in this same respect from him on that, because this is his crisis to handle. This is his problem to solve. I mean, he shouldn't be bringing politics into it as well. So I think that was you know, kind of a one-off comment about uh, Mitt Romney. But uh, um, I think some of his advisors were not thrilled at how that made him look either, because uh, I mean, he's supposed to be handling this. Uh, he's not supposed to be talking about his arrival and bringing domestic politics into this uh, still very s serious international crisis. And the danger for the Romney campaign is that if they keep being talked about as though this looked like a desperate move on their part, that reinforces a narrative about them that they're sort of trying to come from behind in a way that's unseemly. I think that's right. And this is a uh, work in progress for the Romney campaign. I mean, this was the first a sort of a real-time international event that they've had to deal with um, through their campaign. So it's a learning curve for them. I mean, like they don't have access to all the information that uh, the White House has that the, that the uh, president have. But I am told that Governor Romney is very soon going to be getting the same intelligence briefings and the same national security briefings that uh, presidential candidates are um, allowed to get uh, once they're the nominees. So that will also uh, per potentially make him look more presidential and give him more information on which to base his decisions. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Megan. Even as the focus stays on these protests across the Middle East, another serious foreign policy challenge reverberates through the campaign. That's the, Israel's rocky relations with the U.S. White House correspondent Mark Landler joins me now from Washington to talk about that. Hey, Mark. Hi, Megan. So, Mark, uh, the relationship between the president and uh, the prime minister has never been a very warm one. Uh, but people are talking about how it's really never been worse than it is right now. How tense is it? Well, uh, you can uh, one, one measure of that might be the the very strange uh, attempt that the two men had to have a meeting, uh, which uh, on the uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in a couple of weeks in New York, uh, there won't be a meeting. It didn't come through. Um, all signs point to the White House being reluctant to meet with the Prime Minister at this point, um, largely because President Obama feels that he's laid down a red line. Uh, on Iran over its nuclear program, and he doesn't want to continue to litigate that issue with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, particularly in the heat of a presidential campaign. So, Mark, was there a meeting? Wasn't there a meeting? Was a meeting requested? Wasn't it requested? Well, all sides are now um, sticking to a White House statement that says that the Israelis never formally asked for a meeting. Um, if you look at the calendar, uh, it is the case that President Obama is going to be in New York just for a, a couple of days. They don't overlap with the days that the Prime Minister is going to be in New York. Uh, the President has a busy campaign schedule, so it seemed uh, difficult for the Prime Minister to come and see him in Washington. Um, that said, look, if, if two leaders of, of close allies want to have a meeting, uh, they're going to have a meeting. So clearly, uh, on, on one side, I suspect more on the U.S. side, there's a feeling that there wouldn't be uh, a constructive reason to have a high-profile meeting to discuss Iran when President Obama, as I said, feels that he's already taken the line he wants to take on Iran. He doesn't actually want to be pushed uh, into saying anything new, laying down more clear red lines or deadlines. Uh, that's just not a conversation he wants to have between now and Election Day. Now, we had this strange occurrence this summer, a very unusual occurrence, of, of, of Bibi Netanyahu meeting with Mitt Romney in Israel and, and all but endorsing him. Does, does the White House feel like they are actually trying to put a thumb on the scale, that they're trying to sort of interfere with, with our elections? Well, it's, you'd never get a White House official to say that. Really? I'm shocked. Or, yeah. or, or, or even really off the record. But, you know, it's clear in their body language. It's clear that they feel that the Israelis are, and particularly Benjamin Netanyahu, is an astute reader of American politics. 
Uh, he every time he comes here, he he goes up to the hill. He usually gets a, a huge uh, show of support. He's built close links to Republicans, influential Republicans like Eric Cantor, the House uh, Majority Leader. So you know there is a perception that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu knows the political game, knows the pressures, and while the Israelis uh, stoutly and steadfastly deny it, there is a feeling that for him to have weighed in as he did this past week in the midst of an election uh, with such a strong statement on Iran couldn't help but have domestic political reverberations in the U.S. in the election campaign as it, as it has. And how concerned is the Obama administration about what the political impact will be? Well, you know, the Obama administration, I think, has calculated for a long time uh, that they probably have uh, and are in pretty good standing with, a, you know, a, a solid majority of the, uh, of the Jewish American vote. Uh, so I don't think they necessarily see this as a, in fact, I'm certain they don't see it as a game changer. It is true that, uh, that in a couple of states, Florida maybe most notably, if there was a razor thin difference between Romney and Obama, uh, a, a, a major uh, schism between the U.S. and Israel could peel away some Jewish voters. But, you know, uh, I think a lot of this is already discounted. Uh, those conservative or, or, or very far right Jewish voters uh, have probably already made their choice. Uh, Mitt Romney's been actively um, cultivating them and asking for their vote for months now. He's got the support of Sheldon Adelson, uh, the, the wealthy right-wing uh, uh, casino owner from Las Vegas. So a lot of this is, uh, as they say, sort of baked into the cake. Um, but yet yeah, on the margins in states where things are very close, I think the Obama administration would prefer to keep this issue uh, at a low boil and leave some of these very difficult questions regarding Iran until after the election. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Megan. Today is also primary day here in New York, and same-sex marriage is still a key issue. Earlier this morning, Metro political editor Michael Paulson and Albany reporter Thomas Kaplan discussed how it's playing out. So, Tom, it's primary day in New York State again. Uh, New Yorkers have already had a presidential primary and a legislative primary, and now it's a Thursday. Uh, what's going on? Well, the state legislature did not want voters to have to go to the polls on Tuesday, which was the 11th anniversary of September 11th. So they decided to move the primary date to today, Thursday, which uh, seems to have confused some people. A lot of people just don't know that there's a primary today. Primaries tend to draw a very low turnout in New York anyway. Uh, it's expected that the turnout today will be even lower because of the fact that a lot of people just don't know there is voting going on, which has kind of emboldened some challengers who think, well, if nobody's going to show up to vote, if I have a small group of passionate supporters, maybe I can topple an incumbent who otherwise would be tough to beat. Now, there are a couple races I know that have national implications. Can you tell me about those? Well, we've been looking at the primary challenges against three uh, Republican state senators who voted for same-sex marriage yeah. last year to legalize same-sex marriage in New York State. Eyes 33, nays 29. Mm -hmm. Four Republicans voted for it. One decided not even to seek re-election. The three who are running are all facing primary challenges from the right, from challengers who are criticizing their vote on same-sex marriage. Advocates for same-sex marriage are, are watching these races very closely because New York was the first state where same-sex marriage was legalized in part with a Republican-controlled chamber voting for it. And as they look to other states to try to push for legalization there, they're hoping to persuade Republican legislators to vote in favor. And they fear that if Republicans are toppled here in New York after voting for same-sex marriage, it'll be a tough sell in other states to say, break with your party, vote for this, don't worry, you'll be able to survive a primary challenge. So we're watching those races closely. Okay. And now no discussion of New York State is complete without a discussion of political corruption. Uh, I understand that this is a bit of an issue in today's election. Tell me what's going on. It's a remarkable phenomenon. There are two state legislators who are under indictment presently uh, on corruption charges, both seeking re-election, facing primary challenges, but confident that they'll be able to uh, hold on to their offices, kind of an only in New York phenomenon. And there's a, a third, an assemblywoman who is under investigation, has been written about a lot in the press, and also seeking re-election despite all of this. But this is only a primary. The voters still have to go back in November, so does it really matter? That is true, but in heavily Democratic New York City, winning the primary election for a state legislative seat is tantamount to winning the general election. So this is really what matters in a lot of districts around the city. After months of trailing in the race for campaign cash, the Obama team finally edged the Romney campaign in donations in August with some help from their big bundlers. 
Campaign finance reporter Nick Confessori has been looking into the President's fundraising, and he joins me now. So, Nick, uh, the President's team loves to talk about their army of, of small donors, the hundreds of thousands of them or whatever, um, but they're also increasingly dependent on a very small group of very big donors and bundlers, aren't they? That's correct. If you look at their fundraising profile, what you see is, is kind of a reverse bell curve. They're getting more and more money at the very, very bottom end of the scale, all those $3 contributions they've been asking for in emails for the last couple of months. But the top end of the scale, because they've been fundraising in conjunction with their party for, for over a year, and the top donation for that is around $30,000 a year, they also have a lot more of these really big checks, and that means bundlers, the people who know who to find to give those checks. So who are some of the big bundlers? Well, you know, the people you'd expect to some extent, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's thrown big fundraisers, the Hollywood producer, Anna Wintour of Vogue, uh, although it was surprising to me uh, in our story today to see just how far up in the list she was. There's a guy that your average person hasn't heard of but who's well-known in politics. Um, Andrew Tobias is a Miami novelist who is also the treasurer of the Democratic National Committee. He appears to be, according to this chart that we have as of May, the single largest bundler uh, for Obama in 2011 and 2012. Then is also another surprise. We saw that Terry McAuliffe, a former DNC yeah, chairman, to see who that. was very close with Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, is up there in his top 11, I think, or top 12. Uh, and that's all based on a single, I think, a single large fundraiser he did in McLean, Virginia, uh, recently with Bill Clinton, the former president, for Mr. Obama. And so it shows you that, like, this is a guy who was spending uh, a long time trying to beat Obama in the primaries four years ago, has now become one of his biggest bundlers. Like Bill Clinton. Like Bill Clinton. Um, now, the president is sort of famously hostile to the care and feeding of donors, but uh, that aside, this whole group got quite a few perks and special benefits in Charlotte, didn't they? That's correct. The documents that we obtained show essentially all the packages uh, of donor perks that are awarded to each of these bundlers, and essentially, uh, you know, the more you raise, the more you get, the more access you get. What were some of the best perks? Well, you could decide uh, if you wanted to stay at the Ritz-Carlton or the Westin, which were two centrally located uh, uptown hotels in Charlotte, close to the convention center. Uh, there were private briefings uh, with uh, campaign officials. Uh, there was a breakfast, I believe, with Michelle Obama. And you could also have your picture taken at the podium where the president would be speaking, I believe, on the morning that uh, he was going to speak. So these are kind of the things, you know, very standard in politics, not atypical. Uh, it's not about policy. But definitely, they are trying to reward these guys, give them some perks, and give them reasons to keep giving more. Now, as you say, this is very standard in, in, in politics. Obviously, the Romney campaign does very much the same thing. Are there any differences between the two in the, in the kinds of benefits that they are giving? I think when you have an incumbent president like Obama, uh, who also doesn't really enjoy uh, donor maintenance, as we call it, uh, there's a little, a slight, you know, bit of distance between the principal, the president, and the donors. Uh, for, uh, for, for Mr. Romney, who really takes to fundraising, and in fact, fundraising was basically his job at Bain Capital, right. was to go and ask people for money, and then, of course, invest it in companies and turn them around or sell them off. Uh, so he's a guy who loves it, who loves the hunt, who's good at it, um, and he's not an incumbent. So. There isn't quite as much infrastructure around him as the principal, and I think uh, his, uh, his campaign has put him a little more in closer contact. So at the Republican convention in Tampa, there was a thank you for the very top bundlers to the Romney campaign, uh, and Mitt Romney was there personally. I believe he also was on a yacht uh, anchored off uh, the coast by the convention uh, where a bunch of the bundlers had gathered to celebrate. Now, we were mentioned earlier that the Obama campaign actually outraised the Romney campaign just for the month of August. Uh, but they've been getting sort of regularly outraised, and they're certainly getting clobbered on the super PAC level. How concerned is the campaign really about this? How much of their concern about it is a ploy to get donors revved up, and how much of it is mm. legitimate? I think they aren't concerned about beating Mitt Romney and the RNC. I think that they believe they will be competitive with Mitt Romney and the RNC. What they're fearful of is the super PACs and the outside groups. The thing with that is you can sort of get a sense and compete on a level playing field with traditional bundraising, uh, sorry, a, a, a bundling of fundraising. Everybody has the same federal limits. Everyone has the same constraints. With super PACs, all it takes is one or two motivated rich guys, yeah. Sheldon Edelson's, opening their wallet 
and all of a sudden you're looking at a deficit of 10 or 20 or 40 or 100 million dollars. And there just seem to be more of those folks on the right than the left this year who want to give and who are playing in a really big way. So the Obama people are very concerned about that imbalance. And part of the reason they're driving so hard on their own fundraising is not so much to beat Mitt Romney, but to beat Mitt Romney and have enough left over to counter what they believe will be an onslaught from super PACs. Thanks, Nick. Anytime. That's all for today. Stay with us online and on our mobile apps for more on Campaign 2012. I'm Megan Lieberman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.